we established last week that offenses will happen to you and they will happen through you. We looked at an example of Jesus and how he caused offense to some people. It's going to happen. It's, it's practically impossible to avoid causing offense or getting offended. So this this isn't something to say, suck it up, buttercup, stop getting offended. Okay, this, this is just helping you and I as to how to uh, respond to offense, as we say there, without losing our cool. Um, you, you can't control other people's intentions and actions. You can't. And if you can, you're a manipulator and you're part of the problem. Okay? Okay. You can't control their actions. You can't control their intentions. What you can control is your response to their actions or what has happened in that. That part you can absolutely control. And that's where we're going to look at today is handling offense, responding to offense. Last week we were like, hey, you need to know what an offense is. Today, I hope to give you some keys to help you to respond better, but just understand, when offense happens and it isn't dealt with in a healthy manner, there will oftentimes be unintended consequences or victims. When offense happens and if you think that you need to get away from it and you need to run away from it and you need to stay away from it, there is a very high probability that there will be some unintended victims or unintended consequences because you avoided the offense that happened. And like, well, you know, Pastor, I'm, you know, I'm just not a very, you know, confrontational person. I understand that. I get that. But why would we want to not do something at risk of harming other people or making things a little bit worse than what they really are? Now, what this doesn't mean by dealing with this consequence or dealing with this offense is that you're going to say, well, it's going to be this way. It's going to be my way. This, this is how it's going to be. That's a bad way to respond to an offense. If your response to an offense is to tell someone, hey, listen, this, 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 and this is how it's going to be, and if it can't, then, you know, we just got to go our own separate ways. That's not the way to deal with it, okay? We have to be able to deal with it appropriately. I want to look at chapter, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 14 to 15. And I think that this here lets us know kind of an overview of when it comes to offense, what we need to look at. It says, work at living in peace with everyone. Can I just say that everyone is those people that defend you? Everyone is those people that annoy you. Everyone are those people that have hurt you in the past. Everyone is someone that, that, that doesn't like you. But we're to live at peace with them. And work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. If we're not trying to live at peace and if we're not trying to live a holy life, how can we expect those who aren't saved to get saved? It's not going to happen. So Hebrews is setting us up here to say, look, verse 15, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Now watch this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Bitterness comes from us not responding to offenses because what happens is it causes us to rot. It causes us to, to just get eaten up inside and we become bitter and we become ugly and we become upset to where it says no one wants to be around us so we're going to corrupt many. So instead of drawing people to God, we're pushing them away from God because we haven't responded to the offense. For people of faith, not responding to an offense should never be the chosen path. Never. Never. Not responding to an offense should never be the path you take. We've got to respond when it happens. It's counterproductive. Not responding to it is, you know, counterproductive. You know, how many times this kid did, you know, did most of us say, if not all of us say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Boy, were we duped as children. <laughs> okay, because words do hurt. 
they do hurt and they do linger and they do give 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 root to bitterness if we're not careful. So we have to deal with offense when it happens. So what do we do? How do we handle offense? First, it requires determining a response level. I'm saying that we are to respond to every offense. Absolutely. But at what level do we respond to that said offense? How much of ourselves do we give to that person, to that situation? Some of you may be surprised to learn that because someone asks you something, you don't have to be an open book. You don't have to go all in. You don't have to, to let them in on things just because they ask you something or they say something to you. You don't have to just go head over heels into that. Now, at the same time, we don't want to put them off. We don't want to be a jerk about it. We don't want to be mean about it. We don't want to be unchristlike about it. But we need to determine how much of our time and effort does this person deserve. If there is one thing in this world that you will never gain more of, it is time. You only have what you have. And some of you waste it in unbelievable ways. And many times you waste it on other people because you're not sure how to respond to the offense that is going on. Proverbs 17, 27 through 28 says, He who has knowledge spares his words. Isn't that something? That the Bible would tell us, just watch what you say. Be careful to respond to people. And a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. So Proverbs is telling us, chillax. That's what it's telling us. Okay. Just chill out. Relax. Don't lose your cool. Don't spout off all of a sudden. Don't go in to say some things that you will regret later on. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Because he is determining his response level to the situation in front of them. Did you know that you can actually disengage someone before the offense gets to a level of crazy or a level of hurt, it is very possible for us to, to disengage from them. Now, part of this also comes in you and I recognizing a trap. Okay, are they trying to offend us uh, by throwing a trap at us and what do we want to do with this? We've got to recognize that and be able to disengage from that as soon as possible. For instance, maybe you were asked about certain, um, certain views or ideas in the world, okay? Maybe it's conservative, maybe it's liberal, okay? Someone, you know, randomly comes up to you and says, hey, what's your stance on immigration? Someone comes up to you and says, hey, are you pro-choice or are you pro-life? Someone comes up and says, what's your view on marriage? Do you... Do you hold a, a traditional view of marriage or same-sex view of marriage? All of these things that come about, you know, what, hey, what, what's, what's, what is your view on the NFL and kneeling and not kneeling and so on and so forth? Here is what you have to determine. And here is something that I have said a lot, and I was talking with someone this week about this, uh, is, is that... I will tell people this, I don't know you well enough to discuss this with you. I don't know you well enough to discuss, I don't know your heart and you don't know my heart. Now, a lot of times, when did I first start really learning this? When I got into sales with Culligan Water. Okay. Whenever I got into sales and I would be in someone's home and we would be there talking and, you know, maybe the news is on and, you know, maybe it was my news channel, maybe it wasn't, it didn't matter. Okay, you know, maybe, you know, maybe they felt one way, maybe they felt another way, and they would ask me, say, hey, what's, what's your thoughts on this? And I would just simply respond, hey, um, you know, I just don't, you know, I just don't know you well enough, you know, I'm just here to, to do a job, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm about to lose money. 
Okay? But that was really a way for me to avoid offense. For me to be able to, to disengage this situation before something ever happened. The response level is, is minimal when you can tell someone, when you see that trap, I don't know you well enough to discuss this subject. Or it might be, I know you too well to discuss this situation because I know how you feel and you know how I feel. Let's just agree to disagree. Okay? There was nothing wrong with that because there are things that that I see different, that some people see different, and that all of these things, and that is just fine. But the moment you begin to engage in that conversation, you are setting yourself up for bad responses. Because here's why. Most of the time, the level of hurt from an offense is because of an improper response and not the actual incident. The question, the situation, the topic, whatever happened, that doesn't usually cause the hurt that stings and burns and pains us. It is the response to the offense that causes the hurt, that causes the pain, that causes us to want to push this person out of our life forever. Not because of what was asked or because of what happened, but because of the response to that. Life is too short for you and I to be wasting our times on people that are trying to trap us and they are more concerned with winning an argument than they are in winning someone to Jesus. So determine the response level before you engage in that offense. Secondly, handling an offense requires seeing the person and not the past. You got to see the person and not the past. Because many times offense comes from those that we do know well. And those that we do have a love for. And those that we may share the last name with. And those that we may be at the family reunions with. And those that we go to work with every day. And we oftentimes, it, but, but can we see the person and not the past? What I want to do here today is I want to look at two Old Testament individuals on how they handled offense. First I want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I want to start in verse 6. It says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel and met King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, and with timbrels and with lyres. As they danced, they sang, listen to this, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Saul's offended, right? He's offended because he used to be the boss, okay? He used to be the man, and all of a sudden, David comes on scene after taking out all of these people, including Goliath, right? Because this is happening right after that. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom, and from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Now, let me just tell you that he didn't keep a close eye to look out for him. He kept a close eye on him for a chance to get at him. There are some people that are keeping a close eye on you because they are waiting for you to not respond like Jesus in something. They are waiting to be able to say, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a board member. I thought you played on the worship team at your church. I thought you taught kids. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought. And why would you, they're, they're keeping a close eye on you to see you fall. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was, he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall, but David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaigns. How many of you know that he was trying to set him up for failure? In everything he did, 
He had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. Now he's challenged by David. He's offended and now he's challenged by him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Jump ahead with me to verse 29. Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. Now, as I was preparing for this, and maybe some of you know, maybe some of you were following along with me, before I jump into a lot of the heart of this, I want to address verse 10. Because if you're with me, you're like, whoa, hang on a minute. Verse 10, Saul became the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. Now, if you've been to church for any amount of time, you're saying, hang on a minute. What does that even mean? God won't tempt people. God can't carry out morally evil acts. Why does it say evil spirit? I wanted to stop and give you a little bit of context for this. Now, of course, I know whenever I come across something that doesn't make sense to me in text or has me confused, what I do is I will do a couple of things. The first thing I will do is I will look at where else does this appear in the Bible. Okay, some of you are about to have a nice Bible study lesson here. So whenever you see something like evil spirit, I'm like, where else does this appear? And what does it mean? And in the Old Testament, it is much like what we read here with what's going on with Saul. In the New Testament, we see it more as demonic activity, evil spirits cast it out, evil spirits saying, hey, you know, Jesus, I know, but who are you? So we have a difference here of some things happening. Why is this like this? And then another thing that I do is I will try to look at the original language. Now, I'm very limited into what I know of the original language of Hebrew for the Old Testament and uh, Greek and Aramaic for the New. But thankfully, I have someone that I know who knows a lot about this. And so I called up a friend of mine named Keith who helped me with some Bible studies back in Ohio who was part of the church. And he has a major in... Um, uh, Hebrew and Greek. I'm t every pastor needs a Keith Bartram in their life if, if they haven't majored in original languages themselves. And so basically I presented things to him and he said, okay. He wanted to make sure that I did, did a little bit of research first. <laughs> you know, because, and this is what I love about some men in my life because when I called them with something, it's not just, okay, let me help you out, but they're saying, what have you figured out? What are you leaning toward? What do you think is going on? What do you think is happening here? Because they're not just going to give me the answer. They want to say, hey, are you just trying to weasel out of this? Or did you put anything into this before you called me? I shared with him what I thought. Here's where we're going with. The root word, or I'm sorry, the, the root for the word evil is ra. Now, what you have on the left here is the actual Hebrew Okay, which looks like a squiggly Y with the seven with the line underneath of it. That is the Hebrew for this term Ra. So again, we are going back to the original. Okay, essentially this means evil, wickedness, mischief, hurt, harm, bad, trouble, sore, affliction, ill, adversity, anything with evil that we can really kind of think of. Now, here's where... Here is where we get into different forms. Because in Hebrew, words often have male and female forms. Male tends to be physical, female tends to be non-physical in how they use this. In this text, ra is an adjective and female, though the recipient is male. I'm going to lose some of you. If you need to know more, catch me afterwards, okay? But I really think that this is important for us to understand what's going on here because I'm, because I'm not just going to skip over this and, oh, yeah, great message, Pastor. I want to take you a little bit into what's happening here, okay? The female adjective form would mean we would first expect to translate the word not to be a moral evil, 
It would be more of a eternal bad, um, something like misery, something something along those lines, unless context, because remember, when studying God's word, context is king, okay? Unless context tells us otherwise. So, this is an odd pairing, okay? Because we've got female and male um, forms of words here all together. In Hebrew, if you have a masculine word, you use a masculine adjective so the reader knows they're paired together. But that's not what happened here. Because we know spirit's masculine, God's masculine, Saul's masculine. Why a female adjective here? The author likely purposefully used the wrong gender to emphasize an eternal struggle happening. He, he wanted to say, hey, think about what, what the pairing is here because there is an eternal struggling happening here. Now, keep in mind that that the Holy Spirit's job in the Old Testament was different than the Holy Spirit's job in the New Testament, okay? In the Old Testament, we read that the Holy Spirit came on them and then he would back away from them. He would be on them for a season. He would be on them for a word, for a prophetic word. And, but then in the New Testament, we now know that he dwells within the believers in Christ. So we got to know that part as well, okay? So there's a difference of the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. I hope you're still with me. A lot of you look like you're confused. I don't blame you. Essentially, what we see here is God bringing conviction to Paul. Paul was tormented by this and fell deeper into sin rather than turning away from it. Okay, so you put all that together. Here is where we arrived, essentially. The next day, a convicting spirit of God came upon Saul. Not an evil spirit in the sense that we think evil. God cannot perform morally evil acts, okay? God does not tempt us, okay? He does not do that. That is, that, is, that is out of his nature. So when you come across something in the Bible that makes you go, hmm, look into it a little bit more, okay? So let me look at someone else here in Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, uh, we have a couple guys named Lot, and at this time, Abram, his name's not Abraham yet, but we've got Lot and Abram. Uh, basically, we have Lot and his uncle, Abraham, okay? They are in a land dispute because they had too much stuff. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> I've got too much stuff. You've got too much stuff. This isn't going to work, okay? Kind of like how some people just have too many people living in their house with them. <laughs> that could possibly be on their own. And so we see that there's this, there is this dispute happening. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Genesis 13, verse 7. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So you don't just have Lot and Abraham, but you've got other people there too. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Sounds fair, right? Your people's upset. My people's upset. You and I come together and we're just going to try to come up with a solution. How many of you know that Abraham in this tried to keep the opposition to a very minimal? He wanted to respond righteously. He, he, he was addressing, there's a problem. There's too many people, too much stuff, and not enough room. What are we going to do about it? So he says, hey, if you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. You kind of feel like they might have been doing a little bit of the cha-cha slide there. I mean, I, I kind of read into that a little bit, but I don't know. So, so basically what happens is Lot goes one way uh, towards Sodom. Abraham goes the other way towards Canaan. And now 
what we read before we get to Genesis chapter 14 is there's four kings that they come and they want to battle it out and they happen to be close to where Lot was. So Genesis chapter 14 verse 12 tells us they being the four kings and those men, they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possession since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abraham, the Hebrew. Now, now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. Abram's like, I know some people. <laughs> I got some people. Abraham's like, we roll deep. When we roll, we roll deep. I got some people here. So he comes in here. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, remember, just one chapter ago, their people weren't getting along. So they went their own separate ways. He heard that some people took his nephew. He called out 318 men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them and he routed them pursuing them as far as Hobot north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. We see that Abraham discovered how to handle offenses and refuse to, to let that fester and to let that boil up to the fact when he went to rescue Lot. Now, what does this look like now? We get in a disagreement with someone, probably on social media. Someone has probably used all caps to make their point. <laughs> and so we click the unfriend button on them, and we are like, I'm done with you. And when we see them, we walk on the other side of the street, okay? Whenever we happen to come in the same aisle at Walmart, we do the stare down. We'll say nothing because, oh, they know and I know and we've, so, but not here. They're like, hey, you're in trouble. But now if we hear someone's in trouble, we're like, huh, you deserve it. Knew it was coming. It's what you get for messing with me. Not Abraham. He's like, lots in trouble, let's go. Whereas Saul, on the other hand, what were we told? He hated him the rest of his life. Because he never addressed the offense. Because offenses left abandoned are door openers for future opposition. You leave offenses abandoned and you leave them there and you think that they're okay, it's only going to open the door for future troubles and future problems and future oppositions. That is what Saul found out. He wasn't going to address things properly, and he became his enemy all the rest of the days of his life. Whereas Abraham a lot, Abraham said, listen, I know we had a little scuffle there, and I know that your people didn't like my people and all those things, and we had to go our separate ways, but you're in trouble. So I'm coming to help you, because I see you, I don't see our past. I see you, I see the person if you don't handle the response quickly and correctly, things get ugly. You will become someone that you don't want to be. Your health will be affected. Many of you know the effect that something such as unforgiveness has taken on your heart and on your body and stress levels. And how whenever you're going through something, oftentimes we are wondering how the other person feels. And we'll spend hours and days and weeks with this festering inside of us because how do they feel? Ask them. So you don't have to go through the stress and you don't have to go through the turmoil and you don't have to go through the anger and you don't have to wonder how to just go and ask them. But why do we go through those things? Because we aren't willing to look at people through the eyes of Jesus. We would rather look at the offense. Finally, three, handling an offense requires responding with reconcil reconciliation in mind, not revenge. When offense happens, 
and bad things happen and terrible things happen and relationships are scarred and things are said that we wish we wouldn't have said and things are done that we wish we wouldn't have done and those things are going to happen for many of us here. We should respond with reconciliation in mind, not with revenge. Sometimes we just want to win, okay? Sometimes we just want to win something, okay? I got called out on Friday night at Dave and Buster's, okay? They called me out to, for this contest that was going to happen with five other people. I was just trying to mind my own business. They're like, hey, you in the blue shirt. It's not really blue, it's more like teal, but he's probably talking to me. He's like, come up here and get up there. Now, they preface this with, you must be 21 and over. I'm like, okay, that's, that's me. Then I get up there and I see pictures of clear liquid. I'm like, oh, Lord. That might be a whole lot of vodka. Or a whole lot of water. We'll find out what they're going to have me do here. And so basically what it was was that me and these other five people... We had to hold this picture straight out for as long as we possibly could. I just said to myself one thing. You people have no idea who you're messing with. And I said, it doesn't matter. I, my arm will fall off. And sure enough, the DJ was a good DJ. Uh, first off, because his name was DJ Skittles. You got to be a good DJ to roll with the name DJ Skittles, okay? I'm just saying. And then the guy had a MacBook. And on that MacBook is a nice, bright apple on the lid. And I held that cup out, and I just stared at that apple. And there were things happening. There were things being, I was going to win. I didn't care the cost. Were they offended that some round guy beat them? Probably. Honestly, I stood up and there's this dude beside me. He's 6'2", 6'3", maybe. I mean, this dude was me. I'm like, oh, great. This guy. All bark and no bite. I'm not sure when he went out, but. But sometimes. <laughs> quick, quick, heaven said. But sometimes we get that. I'm going to win no matter the cost attitude against other people and offenses. And we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that. For me, I was going to risk a sore arm. For some of you, you risk broken relationships forever because you don't want to handle responses properly. Because you would rather get revenge and you would rather get right and you would rather win and you would rather post something online that you're not going to use their name, but they know who I'm talking about. They know it's them. And they're going to say something about, oh, sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so, you know, posted this about me and, you know, everybody go and unfriend them and all of a sudden we've got World War III on social media happening. Or it's happening where you get your hair done and you're like, Betty, did you hear what Nancy did? <laughs> okay. And we get to hear all of these things because we're kind of like, I want to pay them back. I want to get at them. Here's the problem with that mentality is that hurt people hurt people. And I don't know about you, but Jesus has healed me of so much in my life. Amen. That I am not a hurt person that walks around hurt trying to hurt other people. And oftentimes, we get innocent bystanders, other family members, other friends, other kids saying, well, if hurt people hurt people, then what did I do? Because I don't hurt people. But we wanted revenge. We wanted to, to just let them have it. Romans chapter 12. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. This isn't revenge. This is reconciliation. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. 
Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Do not let evil conquer evil, but conquer evil by doing good. This means that when someone is out to get you and someone is out to hurt you, that you are going to come out them with Jesus and a little more of Jesus. That, that letting them reap coals of shame on their heads, that means that eventually they begin to feel bad for what they did to you. Some of us think, oh, I'm going to make them feel bad. That's not what it's saying here. Don't repay evil with evil. Don't take Revenge. Your reaction to an offense sends a message to those around you. I've seen it happen. I'm not saying I agree or that I like it, but I've seen it. I've seen it from people in the church. A negative response to something can trash what people already thought about you. All because you had one situation that you took offense to. And you wanted to get revenge rather than seek reconciliation. Your hope in an offense, especially with someone that you see regularly, should be reconciliation. Not pain. Not getting back. Not trying to get at them. But it should be reconciliation. I cannot say this loud enough. Be careful using scripture. with offense. Be careful using scripture with offense. Especially with people who don't really know your heart. And if they're an unbeliever, you're wasting your time. Okay? You are wasting your time. Yes, we need to know scripture and memorize scripture to strengthen our faith in those times of struggle, but not to use it in an offense because Sometimes responding to an offense by quoting the Bible is pointless if you're living your life like you've never opened it. We want to come back with scripture, but, but yet we're li living our life like we've never opened that Bible. But boy, when I need something, mm, I'm going to go to the index and I'm going to let them have it. That's why some people don't want to come to church. Because some of us go around spouting off the Bible in crazy ways and they're like, okay, you know it, but you don't live it. And that's what we need to do. We need to focus more on living the word than quoting the word in an offense. Yeah. What if we actually lived out and walked out the word? Listen, this is not supposed to be used against people. This is not supposed to be used to beat them up and to tear them down. This is supposed to bring encouragement. This is supposed to bring hope. This is supposed to bring relief. This is supposed to bring promises, not pain. Well, it says, that's my sword. Not against other people, numbnuts. Okay? Against the spirit... Against the spirit, that'll probably turn into a t-shirt. Against the spiritual battles that we fight with darkness and with evil. Why? Because our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against you and me and me and you. It is against the darkness and evil. And we use this to counteract them, not to hurt other people. So can we please be a church? That people come because they say they live the word. They don't just bark out the word. So we want to handle offense. We want to respond by determining what kind of response is going to be given. Okay? How much does it need a little or does it need a lot? We got to determine that level. We also have to be ready and we have to be making sure that our eyes are focused on the person and not the past and that we want to seek reconciliation and not revenge. That is how we handle offense without losing our cool. 
So we wrap up this morning. I hope this has brought some some instruction to you. Some of you maybe left last week and you're like, okay, I can recognize the fence, but what do I do with it? I hope now you know. If we can do something simple and, and always keep, always keep Jesus in mind, always keep grace in mind, then we will see the kingdom of God become stronger. We will see people want to know more about Jesus and they will actually want to be around people of faith instead of avoid us like the plague. Because we're not just going to be coming and Bible thumping all the time. Because we're not just going to worry more about getting even than we do about seeing someone's heart restored to God.